So let me start by asking a question. In the last year, how many people here have donated money to a nonprofit? Okay. The last year, how many people here have volunteered for a nonprofit? Almost everybody. In the last year, how many people here have benefited from a nonprofit? About a third, maybe. So let me just challenge that assumption. You know, we are actually breathing cleaner air this very minute because of the work of Connecticut environmental clean air advocates. I have a hearing aid where some of the technology comes from a nonprofit medical research lab. A lot of us went to a nonprofit theater last weekend. We'll pick up our kids from the Girl Scouts later on today, and we have a mom who's in the Alzheimer's Daycare Center run by a nonprofit organization. Some of the people in this room are alive today because of the work of Mothers Against Drunk Driving, reducing the number of drunk driving deaths that we have in every state in the United States. So let me just ask again, how many people here have benefited from being a, from a nonprofit? Everybody. Thanks. So I want to say this because I think we tend to have the attitude that nonprofits are about us helping them, whoever they are, but we're really about us helping us. And nonprofits are really the way in which a community organizes to help itself. And that's kind of the theme that I want to talk about today. Uh, now, everybody has told me since I've come to Connecticut uh, that uh, it's going to be worse in the state budget next year. So uh, that appears to be kind of a consensus. And so I think we're looking to things to think about in the future. And the way that's typically fra uh, phrased is something like, you know, well, we have to do our best to survive. And as the keynote title says, I really think we need to move away. We need to sort of use that search and replace function in our mental word processor and take away the word survive and substitute the word prevail that our goal is not to survive, it's to prevail. And that's, I want to talk today about what that means. So let me ask another question. How many people here have enough money to do the work that they're doing? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> How many people had enough money last year? How many people had enough money five years ago? Right? This is a country we have visited before, a country where we don't have enough money. So it's kind of like we've moved, we've immigrated to a new country, at one with a much colder climate than the one that we've lived in before. And a lot of the things that we've you had used to work don't work here. And there's a real difference between people who move to another country saying to themselves, you know, I'm just going to stay here for a couple of years and then I'm going back home, and the kind of immigrant that says, I'm here to make a life in this country and I'm going to succeed in this country. And that's the kind of immigrants to this new economic climate that we need to be, the kind that says, we are going to succeed, we are going to be hardier because we have a colder climate now. The reality is, is that a, a decision that's hard is actually a decision that's unpopular. Even a really difficult decision, like a decision, for example, to close down an organization, is not that hard to make if everybody agrees with it. What's hard to make is a decision that not everybody agrees with, an unpopular decision. And yet, along with less economic resources, the other big reality in this new country is that the economic resources are changing faster. So we have to make decisions faster. And when we have to make decisions faster, it means that we have less time to develop consensus. It means that we're going to have to make more unpopular decisions. All right, so my first piece of advice is kind of like declare that we're in a new country, we're here to stay, and we're going to succeed in it. And by doing that, sort of by declaring an emergency, you know, you give everybody permission to think more creatively and to think in bigger, more dramatic ideas than things that they've thought about before. All right, so secondly, I want us to think about getting past the idea that growth equals good, right? Well, that's the American culture. Bigger is better. And we all know that, right? If somebody, you say to somebody, how's your organization doing? And they say, well, we're growing. That means they're doing well, right? They don't even have to say anything else. But on the other hand, if you go to a funder and your funder says, how is your organization doing? You never want to say something like, well, we're shrinking like crazy. Uh, that's a sign that you're failing. So we have this idea that growing is good and shrinking is bad. And I think that we need to move out of that environment. Um, instead of priding ourselves just on growing, what else can we be proud of? I think we need to be proud of our ability to grow and shrink, to grow and shrink, to grow and shrink different parts of our organizations rapidly and quickly, rather than just to take pride in growth. 
And instead, we used to pride ourselves on taking a long time to develop a really great strategic plan and then working on it. Now we have to take pride as well in throwing out that strategic plan six weeks after we adopted it because it isn't relevant anymore. I actually don't think we can ever be proud of laying people off, you know, or closing our clinic on Saturday or having fewer performances of our plays. But we can be proud to be organizations that put our constituencies above the immediate needs of staff. We can be proud to be organizations that put our constituents, that are strong-willed enough to put our constituencies above immediate organizational needs. Right. Uh, third, I want to talk about claiming our full mission. You know, a few years ago, some women came to visit me from a public housing project in San Francisco, and they wanted to raise $4,000 because they wanted to start a drill team, for an after-school drill team for middle school girls, and they needed $4,000 to buy uniforms and musical instruments. Right? And so they came to talk to me about this. And after we le they left, I had a great conversation with them, I realized uh, that some people would probably say, you know what, uh, those women in the public housing project shouldn't be doing that drill team. That should be done by the Boys and Girls Club, or by the YMCA, or the YW, or by the Police Athletic League, or some organization. You know, those organizations, uh, for example, they have people on staff who have masters in youth development. The women in this housing project don't have that kind of background. But I'm hoping that you all agree with me that there's something better and more important about having moms in a housing project or organizing that drill team than having one of those organizations do that, even though those are all great organizations. Part of the reason is because they will create much more than just an after-school girls drill team. So if you only look at number of client hours served, they might be the same. But if you look at these women will create a series of personal relationships and networks that will come into play in lots of different situations. If there's a fire in the building, for example, somebody needs a babysitter for a couple of hours, they become, that creating this drill team creates a symbol that's admired by everybody, even if you only have sons. And so you don't have a child who's actually in the drill team, you can still feel good the fact that that drill team exists. Right? It starts, it, step, it sets, it sets, takes a step in creating a community around it, and that community has a lot of other benefits. And the reason I'm pointing that out is because actually every single one of our organizations is like that drill team. The fact that we create so much more than just our unduplicated service hours. We create networks of relationships that become important for lots of different things, including elections. We create uh, symbols for people that even if we don't go to that park, we feel good that we can drive by that park and see kids playing there. Okay? So actually, we are creating this network and symbols of community life that are way beyond our unduplicated client service hours. I have to say, particularly in low-income communities and communities of color, our nonprofit organizations are not just service deliverers. They're part and parcel of the community and the way in which those communities broker power with downtown. They're not just, and you, could, you know that because in those communities uh, where it used to be, for example, when somebody like a mayor would say, who, can I, who do I need to kind of broker stuff with in that community? People used to maybe refer to a minister or a priest or to somebody who owned a bunch of restaurants and now in almost every low-income community and community of color, people will point to nonprofit sector leaders as the ones who broker power for that particular community. I want to say that what I mean by the idea of switching survive to prevail, prevailing is about looking at what's really meaningful. Meaningful. It's looking at these other parts of the mission. So for example, if we were that drill team, we wouldn't just be looking at how many girls came to how many hours of practice. We would be looking at the community that we're building, at the network we're building, at the sense of self-reliance and hope and optimism that people are building. And we would claim that as part of all for our, our whole mission, not just claim the work that is the, the mission work that we describe on our grant proposals and government contracts. And you know, I think one of the reasons I was asked to speak here today is because I'm a pessimist, which doesn't just mean grumpy, okay? Although I, I am grumpy too, but nonetheless, um, 
I want to say that pessimism is kind of about an assessment of the situation, and optimism is about an orientation of the spirit. So it's quite possible to be pessimistic and optimistic at the same time. Surviving or thriving is about ourselves, and it's about growing. And prevailing is about other people, and creating, being part of a community, like all of us are part of this community that we not only provide, but we also serve and are served by. Um, and represented by the institutions of our community. So, you know, in the, kind of the old way of thinking about strategic planning was sort of started with the question, what are our goals, right? What are our goals? What do we want to achieve? And I would like us to think a little bit less about what we want to achieve and ask instead, who is our constituency and what do they need us to achieve? Who is our constituency and what kind of organization do they need us to be? But instead of trying to figure out what kind of a leader, quote unquote, do I want to be, think about what kind of an executive director does this organization need me to be right now? And there's some times in which your organization will need you to be facilitative and nurturing and listening. And there are other times when your organization needs an executive director who declares martial law and makes decisions that are going to be unpopular. Uh, and if you're a board member, ask yourself not what kind of a board member do I want to be, but, but, or even how do I become effective as a board member, but instead what kind of a board member does this organization need me to be right now? And that might be this, that might be this month a uh, board member who supports the executive director, and next year it might be a board member who supports the firing of the executive director. And I have to say that actually organizations don't have visions. People have visions. Individuals have visions. And the fact is, as individuals, we choose nonprofits as the vehicle for which we can achieve that vision. So actually, as individuals with vision, we make use of nonprofits, not the other way around. And I hope that one of the things you'll be thinking about here is instead of what can the Connecticut Nonprofit Association do for me, but instead ask, what is my vision for the Connecticut nonprofit sector, and how can I make use of the Connecticut Association of Nonprofits? in order to achieve that vision. So I just wanted to remind us of four important facts about what we're up against right now. So first of all, I just want to say what the definition of, first one is poverty. You know, the definition of poverty right now in the United States is if your family is going to be officially poor, you have to have for a family of four a maximum income of $22,050. Okay, for a family of four, $22,050, or else you're not officially poor. Right? And even with such a crazy definition, one in every six American children is officially poor. And then secondly, in regards to kind of America's great crime zone race, you know, one in every three young African American men right now is an unemployed, one in every three. Okay, that's more than four times the rate of adults in general. Now, if that were being reported to us about any other country than the one we live in, we would see it for what it is, which is structural abuse against a segment of our population. But because it's here, we just somehow kind of learn to live with it. So number three, environmental health. Did you know that one in every five visits to a hospital emergency room for a child is related to asthma? One in every five hospital emergency rooms visits by children is related to asthma. And so think about what would happen if we cleaned up our air. We would not only have healthier children, well, and healthier adults too, I'm in favor of that, but we would also reduce our health care costs enormously. So the fact is, is that uh, we nonprofits are very, very strictly prohibited from supporting candidates for election as organizations. We can certainly do so when we do do so as individuals, but not as organizations. Um, so the point is simply that um, our voices are being heard, um, and in a democracy, there isn't anything more important than the freedom of assembly and the freedom of petition, which are two of the, two, the freedom of petition, of assembly coming together in groups 
the freedom to petition, in other words, the freedom to complain, uh, those are two hallmarks of the nonprofit sector. And so these things, poverty, race, environmental health, and democracy, these are the big causes that, we're, that we are all, as a community, working on and benefiting from. And it's exactly in these particular lights that I want to make sure that we change our outlook from trying to survive, which is about us and change in fact to trying to prevail, which is about our constituencies and what they need us to be right now. Thank you.